Hello, and welcome to this webcast on the Financial Markets Regulatory Outlook for 2017. I'm David Strachan, and I'm the lead partner at Deloitte's Centre for Regulatory Strategy in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Our centre is a team of industry and regulatory experts who are at the forefront of understanding and advising on post-crisis developments in the financial services industry. Our regulatory outlook is the culmination of our thinking throughout the year. It aims to give you our views on the most important trends we see for the sector in the year ahead. Now, you can download a full copy of the Outlook by clicking on the resource link at the bottom of your screen. The format for the next hour is really straightforward. I'm going to start with a whistle-stop tour of our Outlook to give you a sense of what we see as the most important developments in financial sector regulation in the year ahead. As a famous physicist once said, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. But in the centre, we like a challenge, and we're going to give you our views. Once I've done that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Andrew Bully, who has put together a stellar panel of industry and Deloitte experts who will give you their take on the regulatory and strategic challenges in the year ahead. We're now going to switch to a presentation so you can see slides uh, rather than me for the next 15 or so minutes. So we see three major questions in the year ahead. Uh, the first is, will the regulatory pendulum swing? And if so, how far? Uh, the results of the US election have put the center stage, but are also really important in Europe. Second, how can financial institutions develop sustainable business models given the challenges they face from regulation and new competition, particularly from fintechs. And third, related to this, how do we see the technology change financial services uh, sector? Technology clearly presents enormous opportunities for consumers, for markets, uh, for regulators, and indeed for the industry as a whole. All of those are embracing technology fully but there are also threats here, and both in terms of vulnerability to attack from cyber attack, and also in terms of overall IT resilience. How we have organized our outlook this year is somewhat different. Uh, we have taken account of the uncertainties in politics, economics, and regulation, and we start with a view of the drivers of macro policy uncertainty. We then have five regulatory themes, followed by two industry trends. We complete the outlook with three strategic responses that the industry needs to make in the face of these developments. Before we start on the themes, just a few words on macro policy uncertainty. In addition to Brexit, uh, we see three uh, contributors. First is around low interest rates and subdued uh, economic growth, especially in the Eurozone leading to pressure on bank and insurance company business models and concerns about the impact of further increases in capital requirements on banks' ability to lend. Secondly, political risk and regulatory policy development in some developed markets. And third, rising challenges to the free movement of capital and services across borders. This strongly suggests to us that the risk of fragmentation of global regulatory approaches is rising probably for the first time in the post-crisis era. So we move on now to the first of our five uh, regulatory uh, themes. Uh, the first of those is around resolvability. Now, we expect the focus in the European Union uh, to remain on how banks can demonstrate to the authorities that they're resolvable in practice. That's going to involve a combination of building up MREL, and removing practical impediments to resolvability. And in terms of those practical impediments, uh, the main considerations here are around operational continuity, data, and particularly data for valuations in a resolution and booking models and practices. We don't expect to see the European Union's proposed bank structure reform regulation, often known as Lacanen, to, to do anything other than continue to drift slowly. And who knows, I mean, the Commission's recent and very unexpected proposal uh, to, for an EU intermediate parent undertaking a requirement might even allow the BSR to be withdrawn altogether. 
Insurance res resolvability, uh, certainly a consideration, but we think it will continue to lag well behind banks. However, we note the very recent uh, publication by AOPA of its discussion paper on uh, the subject of resolvability for insurance companies. And that, I think, shows that this subject still has legs. The next topic is around financial uh, resilience. This one's difficult. Basel Committee is clearly working very hard to reach agreement on the residual elements of the ba bank capital agenda, often referred to as Basel IV, by early January. We think it will get there, just. But it's clear that the European Union will consider carefully its adoption of the Basel standards as it takes into account its own economic needs and priorities. And of course, the position of the US authorities is less clear cut than it has been in the past. It's also clear that the combination of bank capital, liquidity, stress testing, MREL, and indeed IFRS 9 will, inve will require investment in much better balance sheet management capabilities by banks. Here in the UK, the Treasury Committee is reviewing Solvency 2. Um, and the findings of that review are likely to address concerns about the design and operation of the risk margin. Uh, those concerns being shared both by industry and the PRA. A third regulatory topic is around conduct and culture. Uh, despite um, concerted, indeed multi-year efforts to do so, firms have yet to put misconduct truly behind him. The challenge is that there are incurred but latent losses, uh, particularly in banks' balance sheets, which defy active risk measurement. Hence, it's of little surprise that prudential regulators are putting the spotlight on the impact of conduct-related losses on banks' capital positions in their stress tests. In terms of conduct for investment managers, the rapidly approaching implementation date for MIFID II will require some uh, to upgrade their product governance processes. And of course, UK insurers will have to contend with regulators' continuing interest in pensions and long-term ret retirement savings. We then think about the regulation of new technologies. I said at the outset just how important uh, fintech is becoming. We're expecting regulatory and political support for innovation to remain very high as a spur to competition for the incumbents in financial services markets. Regulators in France, Germany and Switzerland have all recently signalled their interest in becoming a bit more fintech friendly. But it's clear that regulators now are also al alive to the risks that new technologies pose, both to consumers of financial services and to market integrity. Similarly, while advances in data analytics, uh, cognitive technologies and artificial intelligence will generally be welcomed by regulators, they will also expect boards and the senior management teams to be mindful of the consequences in terms of data privacy and ultimately customers' ability to access certain products and services. And continuing on the technology theme, uh, we have cyber and IT uh, resilience, uh, both of which have uh, risen rapidly up, at, up the agenda in the last two or three years. There's clearly heightened uh, regulatory interest in the ability of firms to cope with rising cyber risks and obsolete IT infrastructures, and that sets the scene for a more active supervisory approach in this area than in the past. We expect to see supervisors articulate more detailed standards and expectations of firms in terms of cyber re resilience. We've seen the US agencies already start to do that last, uh, uh, earlier in the autumn, uh, and that's we're expecting others to follow suit. And testing, wargaming, red team exercises, all these things will be used to show whether the plans that firms have made on paper really have a chance of working in practice. Those were our five uh, regulatory themes. We then uh, turn to how markets uh, are, are evolving, uh, given the added uh, implications that this trend has for firms. First is really around opening up markets. 
And what we're seeing is a very distinct regulatory push to continue to promote greater competition amongst financial services firms for the benefits of consumers and markets. Clearly, MIFID II increases disclosure and transparency across a broad range of products and services. Uh, for banks in the payments area, the Payment Services Directive II will represent a challenge to their business model and could erode profits uh, that they currently have uh, from payment services. So we see the value chain there uh, potentially significantly disrupted. And the, again, in the UK, life insurers will con continue to see strong competition from asset managers in the retirement market, uh, given the, uh, the, the changes to uh, regulations there. So in short, notwithstanding uh, this and adding to the significant pressure on business models from the current economic interest rate environment, seems to us that the existing regulatory driven uh, pressures on margins across the financial services industry will intensify and increase further in uh, 2017. Uh, second area where we see the industry evolving is in the evolution of the trading landscape. We don't expect to see an enormous change in terms of trading venues in 2017. Where we expect the action to be is in terms of preparatory work for authorization and registrations as uh, multilateral trading facilities, the new OTFs, the organized trading facilities, and uh, system systematic internalizers. We also expect to see uh, the trend of uh, more OTC derivatives moving to central clearing continuing. That's not just as part of the mandatory clearing obligation, but also as a, on a voluntary basis, given uh, their capital and collateral uh, benefits involved. In that regard, the entry into force of clearing and margin requirements in the EU will add, uh, we think, pressure on market participants to restructure their product offerings, such as moving from non-standardised to standardised uh, derivative products. So having started with the uncertain economic, political, regulatory background, moved through the regulatory themes, taken account of where we see the industry evolving, uh, what we do in the regulatory outlook is to finish with uh, three areas where we think those developments really demand responses uh, from the in industry, and by the industry I mean across all sectors, but clearly the impact on individual uh, sectors will vary. The first response is around uh, controls uh, e efficiency. Uh, we've talked about the pressure on profitability, on return on equity, on business models. And against that background, the imperative to reduce costs, including compliance costs, will make it essential for firms to turn to new technologies to achieve efficient controls and value for money. New tech, new reg tech solutions will, we think, proliferate, although their adoption will be gradual as firms seek comprehensive approaches that add value beyond compliance. It's possible, indeed likely, that the largest firms will struggle to reap the full benefits of RegTech uh, due to challenges posed by their legacy IT infrastructure. That may hold them back. Smaller firms are well positioned to be RegTech pioneers we think if they choose to do so, but they may also uh, you know, want to hold back a bit until they see uh, tried and tested solutions. But a number of imperatives that really point to controls efficiency and reg tech having to move up firms' agendas uh, rapidly in 2017. The second area is around governance and the question that is uttered uh, from time to time, uh, are some organisations simply too big to manage? And we really see increasing challenges for larger internationally active firms around governance, 
Home supervisors are looking to group boards uh, to demonstrate that they are fully in control of strategy, of risk appetite, of business model, and risk profile of the group as a whole. And we see that, that's, uh, we see that in, here in Europe, uh, we see that across the EMEA region, and in particular we see that uh, in, the, in the US as well, uh, just ratcheting up the demands on the group board and the group uh, governance uh, processes. On the other hand, um, as many of you will know, host supervisors are looking at subsidiary boards and their composition uh, and their role uh, relative to the group board. And again, they're expecting to uh, see uh, the subsidiary boards exert where they need to a degree of independence from the parent. And that may involve taking their own view of strategy thinking through uh, the local business model and the local risk appetite in the light of uh, national regulatory uh, considerations. Now, while those two perspectives, the sort of group perspective and the local subsidiary perspective are by no means, in our view, irreconcilable, they certainly introduce challenges to running a group. <coughs> on an integrated global basis. And in the light of that, we expect groups to review their current governance arrangements. I think that process has started, but it's by no means complete. Really with a view to streamlining them where they can and join up global and local uh, perspectives. And I think in, in that process, two things will happen. There will be a a, a delayering, a decluttering, uh, and a view to uh, removing unnecessary la layers where possible. And I think it will also put the spotlight on uh, the question of regional governance uh, arrangements, and in particular, where, do the, where does the regional uh, governance structure add value uh, above, uh, over and above the group and uh, the local subsidiary. And that brings us on to the third area, uh, where uh, we expect really to come into focus uh, uh, in 2017, and that's around business model sustainability. We expect that to come to the fore in a as a key consideration in managing regulatory costs and uh, starting the process of restoring uh, re returns. It will be, we think, a long journey, but it one that needs to be started soon if it hasn't been already. And as part of that, um, as I noted earlier, uh, there, is, you know, there are many more regulatory constraints to be incorporated into planning and thinking about business model uh, considerations. And one area where we particularly expect to see more scrutiny is it, both in supervisory and resolution authority discussions, in particular for banks, and that's around the coherence of the business strategy and the integration between strategic planning, stress testing, and uh, recovery planning. Often it seems that uh, those are conducted in isolation uh, with relatively little joining up across those three areas, uh, but now a real focus from supervisors on understanding the linkages and indeed the consistency between them. And although uh, typically we, and I have done so, we uh, tend to focus on banks and to some extent insurance companies in those uh, discussions around uh, business mo model sustainability, seems to us very clear that given the regulatory, economic and competitive challenges ahead, business model sustainability is a major concern ultimately across the whole of the financial services industry. That is a very rapid um, uh, tour of the horizon uh, in our outlook. As I say, it's there for you to download. Uh, it's uh, got much more than I've been able uh, to touch on in terms of uh, cont content. 
Uh, but that was really as a warm-up act uh, for what is to follow. And at this juncture, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Andrew Bully, and he's going to introduce himself and the panel. And we look forward to a very interactive and engaging discussion. Thank you very much. So, David, m many thanks indeed for that, that very stimulating, very comprehensive um, introduction. I think, as your presentation makes very clear, the outlook covers a huge amount of, of issues and plenty of material for discussion this evening. So, my name is Andrew Bully. Um, I recently joined Deloitte uh, from the Bank of England, where I was a Director of Life Insurance Supervision, and I'm a partner now in Deloitte's EMEA Centre for Regulatory Strategy. And I'm delighted to be joined here this evening uh, by a very distinguished uh, and I think very importantly a very cross-sectoral uh, panel of financial services leaders and senior Deloitte staff who will give us their perspective on some of the key themes identified in the outlook and what may be in store for the regulation of financial services in 2017 and beyond. So I'd like to introduce the panel in turn. Uh, firstly to my immediate left, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Clive Adamson. Uh, Clive will, of course, be known to many of you uh, in his former role as a senior prudential and conduct regulator at both the FSA and subsequently the FCA. He is now chairman of JP Morgan International Bank, and Clive is a non-executive director at Prudential UK, at Clydesdale Group and the Ashmore Group. Next to Clive, I'm delighted to welcome from the insurance sector, Raj Singh, who is chief risk officer at Standard Life. Raj has a very wide-ranging experience of both the general and the life insurance sectors. Before joining Standard Life in 2013, Raj was CRO of Swiss Re in Switzerland and a member of their executive board. And before that, Raj was CRO of Allianz in Germany. Now, let me turn to the, the home side, if I may call them that. Uh, delighted to introduce uh, Natasha de Soyser, who is a partner uh, in Deloitte's Financial Services Risk Advisory Practice. Uh, Natasha leads our work on all aspects of governance and board effectiveness uh, and she has worked with a number of FTSE 100 banks and insurers on developing and implementing and reviewing governance frameworks. And finally, uh, very pleased uh, to, that we are joined this evening by Julian Leake, who is uh, the lead partner for Deloitte's Financial Services Risk Advisory Practice. Julian has extensive experience in the design and implementation of market and credit risk transformation programs and in the design and delivery of operating models and their supporting IT architecture. Now, as chairman this evening, I have a number of, of questions that I personally want to put to the panel. However, we do want to make this uh, webcast as participative as possible, so we invite you to ask your own questions to the panel as well. On your screens, you will find a Q&A chat interface. If you type your questions into that box, we will be able to see them and I will try to raise as many of them as I can within the time we've allotted on, on your behalf. So, without further ado, uh, and exercising some chairman's prerogative before the questions hopefully fly in over the net, I'd like to ask about a theme which runs throughout the Outlook document, which is that of the regulators' increasing emphasis, both prudential and conduct regulators' increasing emphasis, on the importance of boards establishing the right culture uh, at all levels of their firms. So can I ask the panel firstly how they see this emphasis affecting firms in 2017? And I wonder perhaps if I could turn to Clive firstly on that. Sure. Andrew, uh, thanks very much. And before I start answering that question, I just say I thought the other document you produced is, is absolutely outstanding um, and gives us as industry practitioners a, a lot to think about and chew over. Thank you. Um, particularly if I'm cross-sectoral cross as I am, so it gives me even more to chew over. <laughs> uh, so on conduct and culture, I should like to, to start by framing why is it going to be a significant issue for 17, 18 or, or the years ahead. Uh, and I think the answer to that is that regulators uh, have seen that the costs of poor culture uh, continue to be very high. So we, they were clearly high right after the financial crisis, but they've continued to be very high. And that makes them worry, well, what is, else is there to come? And have firms done enough to stop this very large number to keep occurring. So I think what regulators are looking for, because um, they, they kind of doubt enough, ha, ha, I think they doubt it, whether enough has been done. So what they're looking for in essence is have firms put in place a sustainable improvement in culture so that they behave better in retail and wholesale markets. Uh, and the key word there is sustainable. 
What firms are looking for uh, on the other side is, yes, they've got to deal with a whole series of legacy problems, and a lot of firms, unfortunately, have those to deal with. But more importantly is how do they future-proof their business models so that they don't get into the kind of cycle of uh, bad behavior in business selling, bad behavior in financial markets, etc. Uh, and that is a big challenge for a lot of firms, particularly large firms. How do they do that? make that sustainable. Uh, and my view about that is, A, it's very complex. Uh, it's still an evolving science how firms should go about doing that. Uh, I think if firms think it's just about process improvement and process management, they've kind of lost the, lost the bigger picture. Uh, so I th my sense is that firms need to think even more, certainly in retail markets, about what is it the outcomes they want for their clients start there, then work backwards to designing processes and measuring processes that deliver those. Whereas often the firms, for historical reasons, start the other way around. They, they have got processes and they try and measure how compliant they are rather than start to see what actually is the outcome they want clients to achieve. Uh, in wholesale markets it is slightly different, but again, have firms really thought through uh, how, what does good behavior look like in wholesale markets and drill right down to a very granular level, product by product, activity by activity, where things can go wrong. But it's not just about a conduct framework, it's about the culture that drives behavior. And there I think there's still some confusion in firms, and I see it in, uh, to some extent in some of the firms I'm on the board of, what actually is the culture that pe people are talking about? and people talking about culture in a very loose way. So often they talk about having a culture that's client-centric or a culture that's innovative, but that's not what regulators, I think, are looking for. They're looking for a culture that encourages and supports effective risk management in the firm and a culture that supports fair treatment of customers. So even defining what culture means is a struggle uh, for a lot of us. Um, but then actually measuring where you are on the cultural journey is also equally difficult. Uh, well, we could spend forever debating about it, but uh, I'll shut up shortly. <laughs> but I think the key about culture is not trying to measure it directly because it's very difficult. What you want to measure and look at is the touch points, whether it's an internal audit report or a first line assurance, what's it telling you about the culture of the firm? And that's quite a difficult science. Um, and my sense, therefore, overall is there's further to go. Uh, certainly the boards I'm on want to spend more time on it because we, we're not quite sure yet have we really landed it uh, and have we satisfied ourselves that we are confident we've future-proofed our businesses. Yeah. Clive, thank you very much for that. <coughs> that's clearly a very difficult subject. Raj, you, your thoughts, please, on this? I think Clive has touched some very important things. I think the main thing that's difficult right now is the evaluation of your existing culture. And I think because people talk about a culture in the broadest sense, and how do you focus really on the risk side of it to really get that? What I'm finding more and more, because I'm working on something right now, it's difficult to separate the risk culture out from the culture. It's actually the culture. And you're looking at the risk elements of it and trying to separate them out. So it's a very soft process we do some ongoing measurements which are done annually and as part of our employee survey, but that's a very broad brush. It has maybe four or five questions and you can measure it. But the good thing is it's done consistently across the financial service industry, so you get some high level measure. But to me, that doesn't tell the story. So what we're going through is more of an interview process of really going through the top management and the top operating committee people, doing structured interviews through that and trying to kind of, let me call it, tease out the cultural elements and cultural views. We finished the top down right now. We're about to start the bottoms up to see if it really maps. But the key thing is that all you get out of this is more of a diagnostic. You don't really get an answer as to a measure of culture. You get a bit more of a diagnostic and we have to improve continually. Again, I'll stop there. Okay. Natasha, this must feature regularly in your reviews. Can, can we invite your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I think there's a bit, if I look back at um, the topics that boards have been discussing around culture, there's undoubtedly been a shift. So 
universal recognition of it as being a very important subject. Um, I think people are struggling with the practicalities of measurement in the first instance. And I, I agree with Clive's remarks and Roger's remarks that the idea that you can have just a, a dashboard with a rag rating that tells you magically what your culture is like and that's the answer is, is absolutely not the way forward. For me, it's that triangulation process, and, and this is something I see Ned's working on a lot, which is looking at the various sources of evidence, which might be the employee engagement survey, it might be specific work done by internal audit, it might be the specific risk culture survey process that firms undertake, and trying to piece it together. And if I think through some of the things to avoid, perhaps, um, a, a lot of firms have been grappling with this MI piece, and I think there's been quite a degree of aggregation almost to a meaningful, meaningless level. So firms have looked at a sea of information and thought that it told them something about the firm's culture. And then upon further investigation realised there is no one culture. Actually there are different environments for business units, for teams, functions, etc. And unpicking that I think is, is quite challenging. I, I, probably worth mentioning as well, it's top of mind because there are some specific prescribed responsibilities under the senior manager's regime for chairs and, and CEOs in particular. Uh, and it's fascinating because those individuals really have grasped the issue and I've seen much more active board discussion on this topic than before. Mm. Julian, could I invite your thoughts on this as well? <coughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's, I mean, everything we've heard I think is absolutely valid. I think what we need to also think about is actually what are we, why are we trying to change the culture? Ultimately trying to change the culture because we're trying to change behaviour and conduct. Whether that be the integrity that people behave within the institution, treating customers fairly and actually thinking about the outcome that the customer's looking for as opposed to the outcome that the institution's looking for. And while there's no ways of measuring it, there's also how do you actually change the behaviours and also how do you make that sustainable going forward because often the way that, you know, when I discuss it interestingly, I've been talking to a few HR leaders about this, you know, some of the, some of the aspects they will look at will be, for example, how do I recruit? What are, what are the values and the characteristics I'm looking for for the rec recruitment process? How do I screen people in terms of looking for, you know, testing how people behave under stress or under certain types of um, metrics and incentives? Um, the second uh, aspect is actually around how you measure and reward performance measuring performance, embedding behavioural measurement and, and rewarding that and recognising that's important and not just being purely measured and rewarded basis, basically on financial performance because that's often what can drive uh, poor culture in an organisation. I think the third one is um, tone from the top. Culture ultimately and the change in behaviours has to be led by you know, the senior executives who are also coming back to Tasha's point are actually subject to the senior management regime so they actually have probably the highest vested interest in making sure that the culture and the behaviours are changed. But by changing the tone from the top and the behaviours from senior management that starts to set the role modelling and examples of how the whole of the organisation should behave either whether that's treating how they speak with customers and also how they talk to each other internally and I've seen a lot of good work in a number of institutions where there's been a lot of focus around respect and integrity and about how you how you behave towards each other as well in institutions. It's quite interesting when you look at how professional sports um, teams do that in terms of how they in, in, embed integrity and, and culture and how they and how they raise their performance that way. So I think also getting the culture and the behaviours right can actually create more value for the organisation because by actually looking after the client, acting in the client's interest, you're by definition you'll get a better outcome for the client, you'll get repeat business from the client, but also you'll attract new clients because they'll know that it's an organisation that they can really trust. Panel, thank you for that. A huge issue, obviously. Now, the questions are starting to come across um, in cyberspace. And the <laughs> already there's a, a congregation around um, business model sustainability, and in particular the implications of the low interest rate environment. So I wonder if we can turn to that, and in particular, uh, interested in the panel's views on how firms can best respond to this present interest rate uh, environment. Again, Clive, could we uh, start with you on that? It's a, a big question. Um, Fortunately, though, it, it affects different sectors in different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you think about uh, retail banking or SME banking, the what, what's clearly had an impact at low interest rates and therefore the compression of net interest margin and, and that, that leads through to the P&L and, and low returns. Uh, we're probably past uh, the, the trough of the interest rate cycle, so things may look a little bit better, but I don't think anybody can rely upon getting back to what it was before. 
So the answer to me in uh, kind of the retail banking environment is there is no option other than to have a very efficient operation and attack the cost base. Uh, and those firms, uh, in my view, that are going to be successful in the future, one of their characteristics uh, will be a very low cost income ratio that's sustainably low. Uh, and that will require uh, then, and you've touched on it in your, in your review, uh, greater use of technology and a re-engineering of back office processes right across from beginning to end, uh, as well as the front end to customers. Um, so that's sort of retail banking and same elements in wholesale. Insurance, uh, sort of, I'll talk about more, but it's uh, the, the issue in, in senior life insurance, um, which, I, which we've seen uh, uh, one of the firms I'm on the board of, is, is, is the painful effect of low interest rates, uh, which has a dramatic effect on solvency calculations. But it's not just low interest rates, the volatility around them uh, is difficult. Um, and the answer to that clearly, uh, firms have changed their business models to react to that. They've a lot, a lot of firms have either pulled out of or retracted from the annuity marketplace as a, as a direct consequence of that, uh, because that is now a lower return business. Um, but it's also a question whether uh, we can lobby enough to change some of the regulation around uh, the treatment of the risk margin, which is one of the, the causes of volatility. Um, asset management is also interesting. It's, I haven't really touched on uh, the effect of low interest rates on asset managers, but there is a big effect of uh, expected returns in asset management are now lower for funds than they, than they otherwise would have been, and particularly the case of interest rates lower than longer. And that puts pressure on as, as, asset managers to demonstrate value, uh, given that charges then as a proportion of return have gone up. Um, so how to asset managers demonstrate value in a continuing low interest rate environment, uh, I think it's a big challenge for them. Raj, can we turn to you in particular? Obviously, this, this is a massive issue for, for the insurance sector. And I'm starting to get questions in on this theme around not only the impact of the, of, of the interest rate, the low interest rate environment, but also whether the panel think this could lead to massive consolidation across sectors. Interesting in your view on that. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to address both. I think Standard Life has already modified its business model substantially, but it was more of a broader corporate decision to go into capital light, but also not provide things like guarantees and things like that. But it was partially lower interest rates that started that whole journey, and it's gone further. So we look at ourselves more today as an investment company rather than as a a true insurance company. The name, of course, is Standard Life, and that's what people would think we write life insurance. But we don't, so we do the combination of both. We run a platform business, which is a change in business model, which is truly more soliciting defined contribution type assets or financial advisory type assets, putting them on a platform, and then we have investments supporting that. But I think that people would like to change business models, but the question is how? And, and that's the difficult thing with the insurance sector. So I'll just make one brief comment on PNC and one on uh, life, to just to bring it to, to life a bit. If you think of the property and casualty business, the days of any kind of flow underwriting is dead. You absolutely have to write underwrite extremely high quality, uh, quality business because you can't rely on the returns to to really compensate in any manner. So it's leading to good underwriting discipline across the, across the industry. So, but there there's a real purpose for the product. It's just the product underwriting and evaluation is slightly different. So I don't see huge changes there because there'll be just less reliance on yield. With insurance, there's something very different because insurance is part of the overall, let me call it savings, savings uh, infrastructure of, of the economy. And people have always wanted to have some kind of underpin but the question is, people still in parts of Europe want that underpin. So what is that new underpin we have to think of? Is it floors? Is it floors below? What do we really do with that? Because in some countries, people are just not happy to have nothing underneath it. And in some countries, they are. So the UK has already made a very large switch. So we're, we're pretty fine here because a lot of guarantees are not provided by insurance companies anymore. But in Europe, it's not the case. So I think this shifting of business models requires a lot of thought as to what does the customer really want? And I think we have to stop designing products that we think are extremely intelligent, <laughs> but really dealing with the customer and saying, what does the British customer really want? Do they want to take additional risk because that risk is in their hands? 
and how do we provide some underpin because I doubt broader insurance companies will step back into the deep risk business there. Okay. Julian, just, just to round off this, this part of the discussion, are, are you expecting this, this fundamental interest rate pressure to lead to significant consolidation across sectors? Um, I think we'll definitely see certain uh, firms beginning to withdraw from, from certain markets. I think the thing that concerns me the most actually about low interest rate environment actually is not the current low interest rate environment, it's actually <coughs> the consequences of what's going to happen when interest rates go up because we do live in a, I think in what will be uncharted territory, we have huge amounts of um, fixed income inventory that are held by central banks as part of their uh, quantitative easing program which you'll see significant mark to, mark to market losses sustained by. You've got um, banks now which hold huge amounts of high quality, low yielding assets as part of their liquidity buffer and again when interest rates start to, to, to increase you'll see mark to market losses in, um, or, or the market values reduce and that will result in actually the, the value or the, the position size of the liquidity buffer will reduce. Given the, the pressures on, of capital adequacy on the, on the broker-dealer community, when interest rates do rise, and there may be a situation where actually there's insufficient liquidity in the marketplace for actually firms to rebalance their portfolios to take account of the increasing of interest rates. So I think it could actually trigger a lot more market turmoil than we've probably seen in the past. Okay, thank you very much for that panel. So I'd like to move on. Um, I'm getting questions in now also about technology, surprise, surprise. Um, and I think a theme in particular is how far and whether technology can help reduce the burden of complying with the regulations uh, and, and managing regulatory change. So. Julian, could I ask you to give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, Mark Kahn has probably already answered that question um, <laughs> in, in the uh, front page of the, the um, Daily Mail this week. Strangely enough, I was with a, with a uh, risk function of a large bank um, last week talking to them about what the likelihood of reg tech would be on, on their function. And what, if you look at the context of where we are today with, 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 with risk and, and regulation and compliances, there's been lots of point solutions often implemented to meet specific regulatory requirements. The risk function has become very costly and I would argue it's become inefficient and ineffective um, because of its sheer size. Now you could argue part of that's down to the delineation of the three lines of defence which is an entirely different topic to discuss. But what I would say is that as firms start to look at how they can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of their risk and compliance functions, we're seeing increasing uh, adoption or, or assessment of new technologies and just to give you uh, a flavour of uh, three or four of them. If you look at a risk function, uh, often a lot of um, a lot of the headcount spends their time actually producing reports, cleaning data, doing quite manual um, processes. We've, we see and we're already working with uh, clients in this area of replacing that with um, robotics, where robotics will start to replace some of the more repetitive manual tasks that currently take place, but also gives you the opportunity to embed more controls because you can build the controls in through the technology. The other area we'll see um, significant advances is around cognitive technology, whether that be around looking at trade surveillance and trader behaviour or client behaviour in fact, because there's two things you need to look at, not just how your, your, own, your own people are behaving and what they're doing, but actually what your clients are doing as well and looking for suspicious activity. And we're beginning to see a lot of research uh, conducted in that space. So, and, and the con cognitive will, will also expand further. So for example, if you think about core centre monitoring, we're now seeing technologies used in core centre monitoring, which is actually one, listening to the sentiment of the client. Is the client feeling stressed? Um, do they, you know, you're sensing it's a bit of a pressured sale um, building up, but also listens out to and cognitively looks for patterns in actually the, the core centre person, the, the way that they're speaking to the client, the, the types of words they're using. So you end up with this real-time dashboard. If it looks like this, this client conversation is going into, into trouble, it'll, it'll dash red and a supervisor can actually go and listen to it personally and intervene. So it's also, enab it's also enabling to use technology to actually protect the, protect the client as well. Raj? I think it's an area that I'd like to see a lot of improvement, but I'd like to go to the real basics because we have very good technical solutions that are fintech-like solutions, because fintech's been around for a long time. We just call it fintech, it was something else before. But fintech solutions are around for a very specific purpose. So whether it's trade, whether it's trade, trade, trade related or other things, what I'm missing is this overarching system that can take me through from the emerging side, emerging regulatory regime, to what, from what is, what's in place to regulatory emerging to s assessment through to 
a workflow that transfers on and closing out the item, getting it implemented. And it sounds simple, but and we've been trying to look for these kinds of systems, you only get parts of it. Because I think a lot of time is spent on these different pieces that are quite disparate from each other and there's no linkage and there's a lot of manual transfer in between. And I, and I really think there's a solution possible, but somehow people don't seem to really present anything to the firms right now. So for me, that's important because I think it could save a lot of time because the main thing I want to know as a risk officer is number one, what's out there that I really have to comply with and we won't be able to have the full Prudential source book or FSA source book in a book, but we could select from there and do something. And then to have the assessment of controls which comes in more centrally, so you have a common assessment framework, and then you look at the implementation. But more important for me is that the implementation, it's all in a process workflow because it needs to be there. Clive, any thoughts on this? I think we all recognize that the problem that the cost of kind of risk and compliance has escalated much faster than uh, the revenues and firms has grown, so that there is a problem. Uh, it is linked with the first, second line, third defence, which, which we'll come on to, and how that works. Uh, RegTech, I think it's slightly misnomer in a, in a way, comes with that there's a lot of firms running around trying to sell solutions. Um, and as Raj said, that there's already a lot the firms are doing in their own technology space, and one of the firms I'm involved in uh, has built in, in their training business you know, a completely comprehensive view of every regulation each area has to comply with and then uh, and then using technology to test how it's been done. So it is possible to do, but I think you've got to look at it as technology can, can help and solve routine tasks. Uh, what, we, what we're very careful about that it doesn't take over use of judgment because ultimately that's, that's what's going to protect us. Thank you for that. So uh, I think that segues quite nicely into a couple of areas of, of, of governance where we, we, we're getting questions. Uh, basically, the, the three lines of defence and the parent subsidiary relationships, both, both old favourite themes. Um, let's take the three lines of defence first of all. Um, Natasha, is this model still working? I think it's uh, perhaps a little bit of a, a misnomer in some ways, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So uh, at its infancy, it was always a concept and a very neat concept, easily described by everyone. And, and I think you could probably pick any firm and they would merrily tell you what their first line, second line, third line does. Uh, beyond that, however, that's where the clarity ends and mm -hmm. you get all sorts of variations between line 1A, 1B, uh, differences at a group level, a subsidiary level. And, and so the answer is that that model or construct doesn't really work in trying to describe all of the complexities in a large global organisation. So I, I think in that sense, Andrew, there are difficulties with it. For me, the important thing is clarity. So fundamentally, I want to know who is accountable for a specific area and who is providing a second line or second pair of eyes or check of some sort on that. And for me, if you can answer those questions, you're a long way through. However, of course, there are many complexities in the actual implementation of that. That I think is, is part of the problem, that people believe that this, this model, if they can articulate that at the high level, they've answered it. And actually, there's a lot of work to go through to make sure that risk is properly managed in the business. Yeah. Raj, can we invite your thoughts on this? It would be a pleasure on this one because I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of, the, of the three lines at all because I've been in firms that have not had three lines. But I, traditionally, I come from Citigroup, so I was trained at Citigroup, spent half my, half my career there. But we didn't have first line, second line, third line. We truly had the business. We had risk management, which had a very minor role in this whole 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 story, and we had the third line, which of course was what it, what what it is today. But the real thing that was very good was there was a robust responsibility in the first line for QA for quality assurance, and that always was with the first line. And also there was more focus on separation of duties and that, and having a good QA process. Risk management looked more at the frameworks and the reporting out of that rather than doing things. They did a bit of challenge and also um, more things like that, but not really what they tried to do today. And then the third line was focused on deep testing of that. I think we've confused all the roles. So if you talk to an, an audit person, they say, we want to provide consultancy. I don't think that's the role. I think they need to look at controls and look at them firmly. And I think risk management needs to not build up giant empires of people checking things because the QA is always better done close to the business because they know it much better than risk management will know it. But risk management has a responsibility to make sure the firm
framework is there, the reporting is there, there's some kind of a challenge process, and there's quality assurance of, of that process, but of that process, not duplicating it. So I think, I think the responsibility needs to shift back to first line, and there needs to be a lot of focus, especially in Britain, because I think the first line has laid down their hands on many of these things. They've, they've abdicated the responsibility somewhat because they believe they have the checkers of the checkers of the checkers, when I think we need to go back to a little bit more normalcy. Now, we have to stick with the three lines because it is the rule of the land, so to speak, but I'd like to just, this more clear definition that Natasha talked to before, but going back to more direction of first line. Julian, do, do, do you see the whole technological thrust uh, assisting the model or, or actually maybe um, unwinding the model? Well, I think, I think the technology needs to be applied whether it's first line or second line. But I mean, c coming back to your point, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that because you know, from what I've seen, you know, I've been working with, with banks and insurers in this space for the last 20 years, is the first line has, to a certain extent, giving up a lot of their risk management responsibilities to the second line. And this goes back you know, to the late 90s, early noughties. And also, it's, in my mind, it brings us a little bit back to the first discussion, which was around culture. Because if the first line actually does not feel accountable mm. for risk management from a, 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 an executive responsibility perspective and an accountability perspective, then how can, how can you sufficiently build that culture around risk management and then to create the behaviours. So I, I just wonder whether to what extent the, the fact that the front office often or, or the business line often believe it's risk management's responsibility to the second line to, to manage that actually has, create, has helped create the culture that maybe the regulators are concerned about. Okay, let's turn to the, the, the other main governance theme that's emerging from the questions, which is the the parent subsidiary relationship. Now I think we, we highlight in the outlook that uh, there is increasing regulatory pressure to, to simplify structures and to promote greater independence at the subsidiary level. And that, that's happening across sectors. It's not, not just a resolution driver, although there is clearly a, an important resolution driver. Um, I'd be very interested in the panel's views on, on the impact of this, this regulatory uh, thrust on uh, industry participants. Um, Clive, could we ask you, first of all, on that? It's, uh, it, it does have a huge impact. Um, well, there, there are some quite kind of deep questions there about around how it should work um, compared to how it does work. So, for example, to have firms uh, agree to set up subsidiary boards and in some cases agree to have uh, independent majority on subsidiary boards, is it just done to satisfy the regulator or do they see value of it or can value be achieved through it? Uh, how does it reconcile with management structures? So is there a one-to-one -one relationship between management structure and the, and the legal entity structure, or is it not? And that can create a lot of complexities if it isn't. Um, who's really accountable for commenting on remuneration, risk adjustment in pay? Is, is that the management chain, yeah. or is it the legal entity chain? Yeah. And also fundamentally, in a, in a group structure, to what extent does a group uh, board uh, or group risk committee, group audit committee, does it, does it place any reliance upon the legal entity risk and audit committees or does it just ignore them and do its own thing anyway? Um, so I've seen kind of all variants of all of those, uh, so which tells me it, it's a journey in progress with a lot of clarity <laughs> still yet to be obtained. But the key point I think though is sit, sitting in a firm, not just do it, put into place because you have to do it, get some value out of it. Mm. Natasha, is this the number one issue in governance at the moment? <laughs> it's certainly coming up a, a, a lot. Um, mm. And I think for, for me, it, it's that proliferation across multiple jurisdictions. So large global clients could cope when it was the US and the UK demanding something. And what's happened is that over time, organically, these structures have evolved in response to each jurisdiction's individual requirements. And now I think there's a lot of appetite amongst global groups to take a step back and think, is this actually the model we want? And how is it um, best achieved? And how can we optimize actually this infrastructure that we've built? And it's been fascinating actually to, to watch some of that take place because in some cir circumstances, the intensity of oversight is unrelated perhaps to the risk of the entity or, or subsidiary, but related to 
the management personalities in that particular area. So I think there's a lot of appetite for that optimization kind of process. Mm. Um, I think uh, you know, subsidiaries in the UK, for example, have done a lot of work. They've implemented CRD4, Solvency2. Um, they will have to look out for their own parents um, grappling with this dilemma and learn how to navigate that effectively. Um, I think the other dimension to this as well is we are in a challenging and cost constrained environment. And so there'll be a, a fine line between um, optimization and simplification versus reduction. And so that will again be something for, for boards in particular to be watching out for. <coughs> Wonderful run and run, I suspect. So, so thank you for that. Now, we do have a live audience here, uh, and although we are up against a, a time constraint, we do have a couple of minutes for a question from the live audience as well as from uh, cyberspace. So I see somebody's hand has gone up. Yes, Matthias? Uh, given recent uh, cyber attacks that are uh, profiled in the media, uh, what do you think are the key priorities for firms uh, in 2017 to manage cyber risk? Cyber had to come up. <laughs> um, we have about two or three minutes. Julian, can we turn to you first on this? Well, I think a, lo a lot of people when they think about cyber is how do you protect against penetration and test your applications to make sure they're not accessible. And that's becoming more of a challenge because um, cyber hacking is no, you know, while there's, you know, it's often a, a lone wolf or an individual that's do doing that who can be successful. You've now got the, the, the level of sophistication where it could be state-sponsored or, or you know, it could be criminal gangs who, are, you know, who can be as sophisticated in the use of IT as, as, as the institutions themselves. And there's a lot of work that's going on around building cyber defense. However, and it, again, it comes back to the culture point and the behavior point. What you'll see is there's still this, this exposure which actually is from cyber attack from within. And that may be inadvertent. I mean, clearly you could get instances where an employee is is complicit in actually enabling a cyber attack by creating a backdoor environment or, or providing information to, to, a, to a perpetrator to, to access um, uh, an institution systems. But actually it can be something as stupid as actually clicking on an email which looks quite innocuous and, um, and it actually launches a virus. I mean just yesterday I got, a, I got an email on my Deloitte account from what allegedly was the Greater Manchester Police saying that I was going to be fined for speeding in the Greater Manchester, despite the fact I've never been to Manchester. And all I had to do <laughs> was click on click on this link to see the photo of my car going through the um, through the red light or, or at the speed. And I thought, well, I know what's going to happen if I do that. And yeah, I sent it straight to to IT security. So it's it's actually creating the awareness within the institution and also with the client as well, because often, you know, a, a lot of a lot of a lot of cyber attackers or or, or fishers will. We'll, you know, we'll send emails to, to individuals pertaining to be you know, a bank or an insurance company asking you to provide details or click on something. And again, that can open up a whole new way of cyber attack. So a lot of it's actually behavioural and awareness to actually be vigilant against, against potential attacks. Raj, in 30 seconds, could I invite you? Your, your, your very quick take on this from no, an insurance quick perspective. quick take on this is number one is board awareness needs to be there. You need to have full board awareness so they have a good knowledge of what's going on. Second thing is you need to make sure that they've really determined and understand the true risk appetite they have. I think internally you need to have the awareness, which I really agree with you, and it, it's consistent awareness because basic things go wrong. I would say you also need to get real technical experts to do some ethical hacking and other tests. So we do, do something called red tests to bring them in to actually do some tests. You need to have a board kind of mock event, run a mock event and do those kinds of things. So there's lots of things that you just absolutely must do. But one thing you do have to the last point is that you do have to understand is anything we're doing is probably less than the people that are trying to hack you. So you have to be aware that everything that you're doing as a risk manager, you try to protect. You have to really understand that you're vulnerable at all times. On that uh, comforting note. <laughs> um, so time is up. Uh, can I thank sincerely each of our panelists, Clive, Raj, Julian and Natasha, for the very wide ranging, very stimulating, thought provoking contributions. And it remains for me to invite David Strachan to rejoin us to conclude this webcast. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, that was a really good discussion, I thought, and fully reflecting all the issues that we discussed. Um, and thanks to the panelists and thanks to the audience for the questions as, as well. I think that's really, uh, really good. Um, this was really to whet your appetite. <laughs>
Um, in addition to our EMEA outlook, we have uh, two more to come, one from uh, our center in the Americas, the other from our center in Asia Pacific. Uh, we hope that those, those will be published before Christmas, they're certainly intended to, and we'll make sure that uh, you have links uh, to them uh, when they're out. And with that, I'd really like to thank all of you who've joined us tonight for this webcast. We hope uh, that you find it stimulating. We certainly did. We found your questions stimulating. And we look forward uh, to bringing you more and further insights uh, into regulatory and business issues and the ch associated challenges as 2017 unfolds. I said it was difficult to make predictions, particularly when they come ab about the future, but one thing that we can be absolutely uncertain uh, certain about is that it's going to be a really very interesting year ahead. So on that, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.